Well, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be with you to 3 o'clock today. Uh, happy Monday to you guys, to our viewers, to those in the chat room. We are on fire at the Law and Crime Network. We have all sorts of things to go over. Let me put the glasses on. We got uh, the Dukes case, Scandorito recaps. But you guys may remember the Jason Carter case. We covered it gavel to gavel at the Law and Crime Network. It was a fascinating case. A son accused of shooting and killing his mom. It was a hotly contested case. You see a picture of the defendant there. Well, he was found not guilty. That's right, folks, not guilty at trial. And I have the honor and privilege of bringing on the show the prosecutor who actually prosecuted this case, Ed Bull. You may remember him. He did an outstanding job with the evidence presented to him. But, um, you know, prosecutor, sometimes when you got to convince 12 beyond a reasonable doubt, out on a case of this nature, you're not able to make it past that goal line. So welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, and, and I found out offline that you're also a, a Jersey guy. You come from Edison, New Jersey. So that that is a point, a check mark, well <laughs> in your favor, sir. Let me just get a little background. You are the chief prosecutor, the head prosecutor, and you're in your third term of office. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, that, that's, that's amazing. And, and I was as well. I think one of the first questions I want to ask you, you're elected out there. We're appointed by the governors. I tried a murder case when I was prosecutor. My team thought I was crazy to do it. There's a lot of publicity. Your staff is watching you. Uh, kind of takes on a different dynamic. Uh, is this the first case that you've actually ever tried, or have you tried other cases as well? No, we are a rural area, but this is, in fact, our third homicide that I've prosecuted over the last uh, nine years. Within the first week of me taking office, we had a husband who paid a hitman to kill his wife. So literally the first trial I tried as a prosecutor here in Marion County was a homicide trial. And then we prosecuted, successfully convicted both the shooter and, and the husband uh, approximately uh, eight years ago. Uh, well, I, I have a lot of respect for it because I know there's a lot of pressure when you're the top guy um, and, and that media focus is like a laser beam on you. So, sir, let's go to Jason Carter. What do you think of the verdict? I mean, do, was it something that was unanticipated? Was it surprising when you were waiting for them to deliberate? Were you saying, eh, come see, come saw, could go either way here? I, you know, bottom line, I think if you talk to most prosecutors and law enforcement officers, they'll tell you you try to solve a homicide case one of three ways through a forensic evidence through eyewitnesses or through a confession and in this case we had none of the above so we recognized from the very beginning uh, that this would be a difficult case to present with the evidence that we had but at the end of the day we believed that we had a good faith belief that conviction was likely and so we went ahead with the prosecution but you know as soon as you're sitting there and you present the evidence we we thought we did a good job we clearly didn't convince the jury beyond a reasonable doubt and 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 the chips fall, fell where they did, and uh, you have to respect. We respect the jury's verdict when they come back in our favor. We have to respect the jury's uh, opinion and their verdict when when they come back not guilty. It's the way our system is designed. Of course, sir. Now, listen. Twelve minds are always greater than one. I have found in my life. Do you think it's possible that the jury got it right, and that maybe there's a potential another suspect in the case? And if so, are you looking into or asking the police in your capacity as a chief law enforcement officer to see if there's any other uh, culprits to this crime? I wouldn't have signed my name to the trial information and brought this case if I did not believe Jason Carter was responsible. With that being said, law enforcement uh, will always continue to investigate as we get leads that are supported by the evidence. And, and ultimately, that's what this case came down to, was we had, in my opinion, a number of adverse rulings that allowed the defense to get into some things that, that we didn't believe were appropriate and we thought were persuasive to the jury. We'll have to have an opportunity uh, once this jury panel is dismissed from their term of service, we will attempt to contact them through surveys to see exactly what they were thinking. Was this a case where they believed the defendant was innocent or did they just simply believe the state didn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt? And we'll explore those issues. And of course, uh, we are always attempting to, by any prosecutor, I would hope, we want to be certain we have the right guy. And we, we were certain we did. The jury saw it differently. What do, do you have, uh, before you do that kind of due diligence, which is awesome, do you have an idea in your mind as to what you think the jury had a problem with? 
You know, I, I think ultimately uh, the forensic pathologist's testimony, I, I think we're all familiar with the doctor. He does an outstanding job as a witness. He did in this case as well. I think that the time frame issue was problematic. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I was uh, I was amazed by the fact that when the jury came back into the jury room, uh, half a dozen of our jurors were crying. Uh, I'd like to gain some more insight as to what that meant to them, whether or not it's just the emotion of this entire type of case or whether or not uh, they believe Jason Carter was innocent or whether or not they believed I simply failed to meet my burden. Prosecutor, I'm curious, have you had an opportunity to speak, speak to the husband, Bill Carter, and the family and their reaction to this? Yeah, I actually visited with Bill Carter yesterday uh, to see how he was doing, uh, expressed uh, my condolences as a result to the verdict. But we were we were clear with Mr. Carter from the very beginning that we believed that this would be a difficult case. We now live in a world of, of CSI and other type of shows where jurors want to be firmly convinced. I think that's appropriate under our current standard of, of our reasonable doubt instruction here in Iowa. But it's always difficult to go back to a victim and say, hey, I'm sorry, we, we didn't get the job done. Yeah, a prosecutor, there's something also kind of interesting in this case that I found from a legal point of view, and that is there was a civil trial that preceded the criminal case. And in my experience, when you have both going, typically the civil case is either stayed by the court to the conclusion of the criminal case, or uh, if the civil case proceeds, of course, the defendant, that would be Jason Carter that we see there on our screen, would have a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. How was it that the civil case was able to proceed before the criminal one? And did that civil proceeding give you additional information and data that you felt useful in your criminal prosecution? Well, it truly, Bob, was a double-edged sword. The reality was, yes, it afforded us, if Mr. Carter chose to participate and not take his right to the Fifth Amendment, it did allow us to gather additional statements from him that we did, in fact, use during the criminal trial. At the same time, though, it also put all of the state's witnesses under oath as well, including Mr. Carter and, and his family and law enforcement to some extent, and that then allowed them to have potential evidence for the purpose of impeachment that otherwise may not have existed. So in this case, uh, we we looked at it from a standpoint that if Mr. Carter, that being Bill Carter, wanted to go ahead with a civil case, we were not going to stop him. We advised him in advance that, that we did not think that was the right direction to go, but that's that was his choice. At the same time, our investigation did not stop. Uh, one of the things that we presented in this case, and I'm not certain whether or not your viewers had the opportunity to see it, was some expert witnesses as related to both crime scene staging as well as uh, where Jason Carter's handset was immediately after the homicide. We believe the homicide took place. And what was fascinating to us was that Mr. Carter always maintained that he never left the residence of 132 Perry Street. However, our expert witness indicated based on his cell phone tower information, he in fact traveled to the north and the east of the property, which we believe coincided with him getting rid of the gloves that spent shell casing, whether or not it was one or two, or the weapon. And so the result of that was we thought that was fairly persuasive. And that was evidence that we continued to work through with U.S. Cellular and with our expert during the time in which the civil case was going on. Prosecutor, I got a limited amount of time, but I'm glad to hear that you were trying to dissuade uh, the Carter family from necessarily going forward in the civil case. I presume that's because state's witnesses would be subject to examination and that could hurt you in the criminal case. But the reason I bring this up is because during the course of the trial, and I got to get this because our viewers were fascinated, there's a lot of chat going on about evidence that was developed during the course of the trial. And I'm speaking about 100 pages of police reports, I believe it was. Um, there was an issue, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a police officer that violated a sequestration order. Um, there were some deleted emails, um, and that there was an indication that there was an attempt to arrest prior to the civil case. Um, so this discovery violation issue that the judge found, uh, was did the jury know that? Were they advised of that? Well, I want to take a step back because I think it's important to keep in mind that we have a vastly different opinion than the defense did on this issue. One of the byproducts of all of the media attention that resulted as a, re as a result of this case, whether or not it was the civil case or the fact that we were moved out of our jurisdiction, was that we had tremendous media attention. That media attention developed 
additional leads co being called into law enforcement. Additionally, uh, discovery in this case was not completed until about a week and a half before the trial were to begin. The defense listed, I think, in excess of 100 witnesses they intended to call a trial. We deposed those individuals. Those individuals then, in some cases, provided us new information that they had never told law enforcement before. The result of that was we chose to continue to investigate this case. I asked my detectives to continue to run down every one of those leads. So there is some truth to the fact that there was new information that was provided to law or to the defense, but it was information that had been generated in the previous three to four weeks. So I think any argument to say that there was a discovery violation, no, just the opposite. We continue to investigate this case and we continue to provide the defense, the reports that we had, regardless if they were exculpatory or not, we simply gave them access, unfettered access to our entire file. In addition to that, about 10 days before the trial, the defense asked for, for the very first time, to the best of my knowledge, all emails that had been sent by law enforcement in this case. Well, that took some time to have the state's IT people review an excess of 50,000 emails and then redact potentially confidential information and law enforcement uh, uh, data related to individuals. We also turned all of that over but, but as did, well. But so, did the judge, I'm sorry, prosecutor, did the judge indicate that there was a Brady, that's referring to Brady versus Maryland violation? And, and the second part of my question is, are you saying that those 100 pages of emails and the discovery that was the subject of this Brady ar argument was only of recent origin? It wasn't a long period of time, but did the judge find a Brady violation? Judge did not find a Brady violation. The defense repeatedly attempted to move to dismiss this case. Mm -hmm. The court chose not to do that, took it under advisement, was going to wait until the conclusion of the case, uh, but there was no Brady violation found in this case. Okay, so then my last question on this piece was, was the jury ever apprised of this kind of argument that was going on? The reason I bring it up is, listen, uh, even though prosecutors are charged of being in possession of all the reports, even if they don't necessarily have them in their possession, at least that's the law in most states, sometimes something gets past the goal line by accident. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, it's done on purpose. Um, I have seen judges, though, that will instruct the jury that that violation, that discovery violation, nevertheless has occurred. Did that occur here? It did not. The only, uh, I would say, adverse ruling that the defense got as way of a jury instruction was uh, a spoilation instruction as related to some fly eggs that were located in uh, Mrs. Carter's nose at the time of autopsy. The Iowa State Medical Examiner did not, at the time in 2015, routinely collect those eggs. And as a result, that was the only adverse instruction. Now, I would also note uh, there was also a delay in this case during jury selection because the defense also at the 11th hour listed additional expert witnesses. So we asked for and were also granted at that time permission to depose those witnesses. And so that's what we did in this case uh, at the very end. Uh, even during the course of the trial, we were continuing to do uh, depositions of witnesses that the defense continued to add during the course of the trial. Sir, are, are you indicating to me that in your opinion, in terms of the procedural fairness of things, that the defense was given latitude by the court to introduce evidence perhaps that was coming in late, um, and that somehow kind of threw you off your game, or did you feel you had the appropriate amount of time to prepare for it and the verdict would not have changed either way? The verdict would not have changed either way. I'm not making any excuses whatsoever. The court treated us fairly. The only uh, ruling that I thought was was uh, contrary to the law, in my opinion, had to do with the defense's ability to admit hearsay through Special Agent Ludwig uh, without exception uh, to, in essence, try to prove an alternative suspect. The court, uh, probably something that may be interesting to some of your listeners and viewers, is what was he deemed Saudi 2.0, some other dude did it 2.0, which allowed for hearsay to come in to say, did you learn this? And then give the jury an instruction that said, hey, don't don't take it for the truth of the matter asserted. Simply examine it from the context of did law enforcement follow up on those. Prosecutor, I got, I ten, think I got 10 seconds. Go left. Ahead, I just see. What's the one thing we don't know about that the public should find out about, whether it be something fascinating, uh, just a little anecdotal story or something compelling in your mind? I think one of the things that most people don't realize is that, at least here in Iowa, we have a cordial relationship with the defense bar. This was not an adverse proceeding. We'll fight tooth and nail in the courtroom within the bounds of law, but afterwards, 
Uh, we all go back home. We all know each other's families and we treat each other with respect. Okay, Prosecutor Ed Ball, two things. One, I have a three, three things. Mad respect for you from the Edison piece. Two, any prosecutor that puts themselves out there in the top job for that public scrutiny, win, lose, or draw, I've got respect for. And third, I think the last message you said perhaps is the most important in 30 years of practicing law, a cordial relationship. You fight like hell inside that courtroom, and then you go out and you treat yourselves with respect and professionalism. Ed Bull, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. You got it. Good luck. Okay, guys, listen, fascinating interview. You can only get this at the Law and Crime Network. I'm asking, where else can you go? This is the place to be. We got a lot more coming up. Stick with us. I'll be with you to three. We'll go to break. We'll be right back.